Welcome. This video cast will focus on polyacrylate additives. In short, these are excellent choices for improving dispersion and compatibility and mostly aqueous coatings. Because of this special function, I have invited Chris Mozinski from our NU Deco group. Hey, Chris, thanks for being here today. Hey, Michelle, thanks for having me. Let's give our audience an understanding of what BIC defines as the Deco group. Would you mind explaining? No, not at all. So when we talk about the Deco group, we talk about segmenting our businesses to allow for us to be more in tune with our customers. And we do this for reasons that are both formulation and application specific, so that when we do work, what we're doing is really in tune with what our customers would be doing in their lab. Since we're highlighting polyacrylates today, would you say they're mostly used in your architectural side? Yeah, that would be correct. I think there's a long history of using polyacrylate technology for wetting and dispersing in architectural type formulations. I enjoy reviewing and discussing the evolution of coatings with our customers, particularly as it pertains to wetting dispersing additives. But listen, Chris, I know most folks hearing this today are probably wondering why we're focusing on outdated polyacrylate chemistry. So much has changed, right, from its original use. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think certainly the polyacrylate technology is some of the first wetting and dispersing additives that were used in architectural formulations, right? If you think back like products like BIC 156 have been historically used to help wet out pigments, um, but then potentially they would need other additives to go along with it to help with the stabilization of those dispersed pigments. So the, the technology has changed over time, uh, especially as we've gone from solvent-borne systems to waterborne systems, and then also evolving into products like Disprobic 190, where we could take a, a two product approach and really focus it into a one product approach to help our formulators and customers make best paint. Absolutely. I think polyacrylate chemistry has done a really great job in keeping up with new resins, higher solid formulations and things like that. I completely love the flexibility of polyacrylate chemistry, but I wanna know how does this affect architectural systems? Well, the big thing with the architectural systems is going to be um, compatibility. And the polyacrylate technology provides a lot of flexibility in how it's formulated to give great compatibility. And when, when we talk about wetting and dispersing additives, as you brought up in the past, compatibility is going to be one of the key factors in determining the best performing additive for wetting and dispersing. Right. You're, you're referring to polyacrylate advancements like the Disperbic 190 that you brought up earlier. Um, and its best feature is that it can work in both organic and inorganic pigments to improve the efficiency of grind and stabilization of dispersed pigments. And besides compatibility, we know stabilization is the key function of wetting and dispersing additives. We review this completely, mostly you know, in conversations with customers, but you'll find this also in our tutorials. What other suggestions would you have or recommend for people who are working with pigment concentrates? Well, pigment concentrates are unique because in most instances, they might be looking for something that's gonna be compatible in both aqueous and solvent-borne solutions. And that provides a unique challenge, but also once again, something that the, the formulation of polyacrylate technology can allow. So what we can do with polyacrylate technology is, is create these molecules that have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts that will allow for them to be compatible in both an aqueous or a solvent-borne letdown system. So for pigment concentrates, polyacrylate technology tends to be one of the first choices because of that broad compatibility and allowance to be put into multiple types of systems. What product recommendations would you have that would adhere to some of the uh, functionality that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Some of the best ones would be like a Disprobic 2055. That is a great starting point when it comes to pigment concentrates because it has both that hydrophobic and hydrophilic section that allow for compatibility in different letdowns. And you'd mentioned, um, I just want to go back a second because you mentioned, you know, 156, 190. Um, what about something kind of in between? Like, what if I'm not really looking for, you know, that high end functionality of a 190, but I want something a little bit better than uh, 156? Yeah, that's a great point because the, the Disperbic 190 is fantastic for 
uh, organics and inorganics, which mean that it's going to be used a lot for high end dispersions on that organic side. On the architectural side of the business, you might be just trying to disperse fillers and whites. You might not need something that gives you that high performance on the dispersion side. And we have something like a Disperbic 199 for that. The 199 is a fantastic product because it's a standalone product, whereas the historical products like 156 would be require two, two types of additives in order to give the same function. So you get the, the benefit of the 199 in being a sole product, but you don't pay for some of that high-end performance. So it fits that nice architectural mode when you're doing your, your base paints and trying to stabilize the whites and the fillers, maybe some of the inorganics that might go into that. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Chris, I know your lab does a lot of work helping customers select the right additive. Mostly, do you start off with starting port formulations yourselves and are you willing to share those with our viewers and customers? Yeah, I mean, we do quite a, um, a number of different types of dispersions with pigments and putting them into different letdown systems. And we publish those starting point formulas right on the big website. So if you're ever looking for a starting point for a certain type of pigment or a certain type of letdown system, you can go right on the website and get good starting point formulas that include pigment load and dispersion to pigment um, ratio right there. When it comes to polyacrylate technology, even though we talk about it being, we'll say, old and antiquated, we certainly continue to make advancements in that stage. So we talk about how having hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts on the additive, we can actually use that to our advantage in new systems. So if you think about a traditional waterborne technology for, for uh, wetting and dispersing, because it's waterborne, it tends to be very hydrophilic and can lead to some water sensitivity issues. What we can do today is we can take the hydrophobic parts and hydrophilic parts and have them orientate differently at different times of cure so that when the product is cured, the hydrophilic parts are within a hydrophobic shell. And that's unique because we can do things like limit the amount of water sensitivity that can be attributed to the uh, wetting and dispersing additive. So that can have good durability performance and can also lead to improved stain resistance when compared with traditional wetting and dispersing additives for waterborne systems. You know, you've touched on a lot of the basic uses of polyacrylates, moving into the different modalities of the newer uses, and even, you know, what the future holds in terms of some of our CPT type acrylates. I can't thank you enough for engaging in this topic with me, Chris. We've discussed a few wetting dispersing mechanisms and anybody interested may want to review some of those tutorials to get a fuller um, detail on those. Um, you can also reach out to Chris or myself at our help desk. Please remember that Chris's lab is available for technical service requests too. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks, Michelle.